Hi, how you doing? Good, I hope. Well, I read a book that's really making me think. The Big Con, the true story of how Washington got hoodwinked and hijacked by crackpot economics by Jonathan Chayette. This is very interesting and it's got me wondering about some things. But I won't be able to read it again. But, uh, I'd love to hear from anyone who reads this. If they sent something about this. And, uh, Flap says, American politics has been hijacked. Over the past three decades, a fringe group of economic hucksters has corrupted and perverted our nation's policies. With dark and engaging wit, Jonathan Chayot reveals how these canny zealots first took over the Republican Party and then gamed the political system and the media so that once unthinkable policies, without a shred of academic, expert, or even popular support, now drive the political agenda, regardless of which party is in power. Why have these ideas succeeded in Washington? How did a clique of extremists gain control of American economic policy and sell short the country's future? And why do their outlandish ideas still determine policy despite repeated electoral setbacks? Chayette tells the outrageous and eye-opening story expertly explaining just how politics and economics work in Washington. Through a vivid portraits of perfidious politicians and pseudo economists, economists with wiry analysis of their bogus theories, Chayette gives us the tools to understand what's really behind economic policy debates in Washington, a riveting dream of greed and deceit. And it's not surprising, but this gives a lot of details <clears throat> about what the conservatives have been doing and what a lot of their practices are and just about who they are. A <clears throat> couple of things I in here I wanted to read to you. On page 21, Charlatans and Cranks. It is difficult for most of us to get our minds around the fact that American economic policy has been taken over by sheer loons. Economists, after all, are a fairly sober lot, even if they're wrong. We tend to assume that their theories have at least undergone some fairly grueling academic scrutiny before they even reach the point of becoming a theory in the first place. So if supply-side economics is so off the wall, how could it have survived this review process in the first place? The answer is, it didn't. In his excellent 1994... 94 book Peddling Prosperity the Princeton economist Paul Krugman wrote not only is there no major department that is supply side and orientation there is no economist whom one might call a supply sider in any major economics department to be sure economics departments are filled with conservatives who very much favor smaller government but none of them share the basic supply-side view that tax rates more or less alone determine the fate of the economy. Nor do they believe that in anything resembling the present environment, tax cut can spur enough growth to pay for themselves. Conservative economists do believe that tax cuts can create some increase in growth, but that belief is almost predicate, always predicated on a corresponding cut in spending. Perhaps the most aggressive support for tax cutting from a bona fide economist comes from Greg McAwa, a Harvard economist who led the Council of Economic Advisors under George W. Bush. Mankey estimated that a perfectly crafted tax cut on capital matched by spending cuts could over the very long run encourage enough growth to pay for half its cost. This is far, far more modest than the supply-side claim that broad-based tax cuts without corresponding spending cuts can encourage enough gro gro growth to recoup their entire cost within a few years. 
Mankey himself wrote the economics textbook in which he discussed supply ciders in a chapter called Charlatans and Cranks and compared them to a snake oil salesman. <clears throat> the sole true academic economist among the supply ciders is one Robert Mundell of Columbia. Mundell is undoubtedly brilliant. He recently won a Nobel Prize for his work on international currency exchanges in the 1960s, but he essentially withdrew from the normal academic channels before he began championing supply-side theory, as Krugman noted. The fact is that around 1970, Mundell, Mundell veered off from conventionality in a number of ways. Mundell dropped out of the usual academic round of conferences and seminars and began holding his own conferences in a crumbling half-hattable half villa he owned near Siena. Most important, Mundell completely abandoned his former academic intellectual style. Since 1970, he had written little, and what he has written tends to be marked by extravagant rhetoric, accusing his fellow economists of sheer quackery and espousing ideas that he himself had helped when younger. Oh, I see mental illness cropping up. <clears throat> Aside from popular articles in places like the journal's editorial page, two classic tombs defied, defined the tenets of supply-side economics. Wininsky's The Way the World Works and George Gilder's 1981 Manifesto, Wealth and Poverty. Both have had enormous influence and both capture the feverish grandiosity that is the hallmark of the Laffer Curve alkalites. Here's what makes the rise of supply-side ideology even more baffling. One might expect that a radical ideology that successfully passed itself off as a sophisticated new doctrine would at least have the benefit of smooth, reassuring, intellectual front men, men whose very bearing would attest to the new doctrine's eminent good sense and mainstream bona fides. Yet if you look at its two most eminent authors, Good sense is not the impression you get. Let me put this delicately. No, on second thought, let me put this straightforwardly. They are deranged. <clears throat> Gilder was not an economist when he wrote Wealth and Poverty. Until then, he was known primarily for having written a pair of anti-feminist tracts, and his notoriety drew mainly from his penchant for making comments such as, There is no such thing as a reasonably intelligent feminist. Wealth and poverty, though, launched him as an eminent defender of supply-side economics, just as adherents of the new creed had been catapulted into power. Gilder articulated the new philosophy of the Reagan era in admirably straightforward fashion. To help the poor and middle class, he wrote, one must cut the taxes of the rich. Huh? In reflecting the new prestige Republicans wished to see afforded the rich, Gilder defended capitalists as not merely necessary or even heroic, but altruistic. Like gifts, capital investments are made without a predetermined return, he said. He wrote, In fact, while capitalists may not be sure of their exact return, they do expect to make more than they put in. <coughs> which makes an investment unlike a gift in a fairly crucial way. Yet there was enough of an audience for such sediments that Gilder's book sold more than a million copies. President Reagan handed the book to friends and advisors such as David Stockman, held its Promethean insight, wealth and poverty, poverty, reported the New York Times, has been embraced by Washington with a warmth not seen since the Kennedys adopted John Kenneth Galbraith. From the beginning, Gilder betrayed signs of erratic thought, and not merely in his misogyny. In 1981, interview with the Washington Post, he declared, ESP is important to me. I learned that it absolutely exists. A roommate and I were sharing an apartment, and another man in the building was a psychic. He taught me how to do it. The single most striking trick I learned how to do was cutting 
for the queen of spades and a deck of cards. I got so I could do it time after time. Once somebody put two queens in the pack and it fell open to both of them, I had hundreds of experiences of that sort during that period. The trick is that you have to have faith. Yeah, faith in magic for a woman-hating man. <sighs> in the mid-1980s, Gilder's career took an abrupt turn. He became fascinated with microprocessors and took time off to learn the physics of the new technology. This led him by the mid-1990s to stake out a position as the most wild-eyed of the technolo technology utopians who flourished during that period, and he ended up publishing a newsletter that offered stock tips. Now we have a little bit of an idea what he's about, and I will research him up later more, too. And on page 90, the apostasy of George H.W. Bush. In the Republican cosmology, there was also a very bad man, an anti-Reagan who serves as a cautionary tale. That man is George Herbert Walker Bush. When the faithful invoke his name, it is in rueful tones. He departed from the true path and suffered terribly and deservedly as a result. The lesson of his betrayal must never be forgotten. Bush's crime, of course, was to raise taxes. Though he won the presidency in 1988, in part due to his promise of no new taxes, by the second year of his term, the government was facing a massive fiscal crisis. The catch was that Democrats, who controlled Congress, insisted that some of the burden of reducing the deficient be shared by the affluent in the form of tax hikes. Bush understood that the reneging on his pledge would hurt him politically, but he felt he had no choice but to go along. You can see why it made sense to him. After all, Reagan had raised taxes in 1982 and 1983, and he had soaked the rich in 1986, all without fatal consequences. And it was not at all clear that the deal Bush struck in 1990 was bad from a conservative standpoint, at least not a traditional conservative standpoint, in return for acceding to a small hike in the top, top tax bracket. From 28 to 31 percent, Bush won very stringent limits on spending. It was the responsible establishment Republican thing to do. Conservatives rose, rose up in open revolt in a reaction that was nothing less than hysterical. House Republicans called the budget deal the fiscal equivalent of Yalta, the 1945 meeting in which Roosevelt met with Stalin to map out the post-war world, and conservatives believed was duped into allowing the Soviet conquest of Eastern Europe. What Bush failed to realize was that the Republican established he had known was fast disappearing, and the 1990 budget deal was its fa final gasp. Just consider these three relatively similar efforts to reduce the deficient. In 1982, Reagan's plan to raise taxes and trim spending attracted slightly higher support from Republicans than from Democrats, who traditionally had worried less about deficient, deficient spending. In 1990, the balance began tipping the other way, with most Republicans voting no, forcing the plan to squeak through the higher levels of Democratic support. By 1993, Republican support for the notion of cutting the deficient through a mix of tax hikes and spending cuts had collapsed entirely. And a little of his conclusion, Plurocracy in America. In February 2006, the Conservative Con Journal Policy Review published an essay that was shockingly heretical, though per perhaps unintentionally so. In it, Charles Boex of the University of Chicago argued that there is a link between democracy and economic equality. In an unequal society, the majority resents its diminished status. It harbors the expectation of employing elections to drastically overturn its condition. In turn, the wealthy minority fears the outcome that may follow from free elections and the assertion of majority rule. As a result, it resorts to authoritarian, authoritarian institutions to guarantee its social and economic advantage. And sadly... I believe that's what they're turning our democracy into.
is authoritarian, which is the same thing that Mexico is. And it seems to be sinking in here. And of course, if they obey those that way, then they really wouldn't know any difference anyway if they're illegal than what they were there. Of the many taboos, this was interesting, and the many taboos that prevail among conservatives, the one forbidding any serious discussion of inequality is perhaps the strictest. Any forthright examination of this topic will lead one quickly to the realization that American society has been spreading apart rapidly for three decades and that Republican economic policies have without a doubt contrib contributed mightily to this goal. So conservatives usually ignore the subject of inequality, except perhaps to minimize its scale or importance. I suggest you read this book, and if you have any ideas of what it might be that is aggravating me, let me know. And wherever you are, day or night, have a nice one.